Okay? Uh, let's see. This is one of these should be turned off, I guess. Thank you for the introduction. I find your faith actually promising. <laughs> But uh, I also have to, I was listening to some of uh, the questions to Bob. You talked about variable gravity. Uh, that is the most important experiment. And in fact, we are busy negotiating with uh, Germany to go do an experiment like that. So we just need to find a little bit of NASA money, but uh, we'll be able to do that. Uh, so yes, Ames is intending to do those questions. Well, what I wanted to talk about today is, is a, a more general topic. I know we're going to talk a lot about Mars and this is Mars week, Mars weekend, and uh, hopefully it'll be Mars decade. But uh, the, uh, uh, I want to put this in a broader context. Uh, and it, uh, you know, I think the, uh, there's a field called astrobiology, which uh, uh, got started at Ames about 25 years ago. Uh, and I think that astrobiology is the key question that we're really after. And uh, uh, it has really three parts to it. The first one is, how did life begin? Uh, I'm not going to say a lot about that today, because we don't have the slightest idea. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it's like, how did the universe begin? Uh, each new discovery shows you know less than you did previously, which is job security. I love it. Uh, but there are two questions that I think that, that, that are the core of what NASA is trying to do. The first one, of course, is where else is there life? And, uh, uh, obviously, Mars is a primary candidate. Uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about Mars because everybody else is. I'll talk about other places that we might look for life. Uh, but I think the most critical question is, uh, what's the future of life in the universe? Uh, and this is the real purpose of our human exploration programs. And I'll tell you that I believe that you know, we are sometime in the next few decades, before 2047, uh, <laughs> humans will leave this planet permanently to live in another world. And that should be, I think, our primary purpose in making that happen. Now, I disagree with Bob. I think there, there are new technologies that are needed. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those, uh, although they may not be essential. They certainly will help. Now, the message here I'm talking about today is biology. And I don't know a lot about biology. I'm an astrophysicist, so I can talk freely and speculatively. <laughs> and people can say, you're wrong. But they can say, all right, that's fine. I'm stupid. But uh, I consider the first half of of the second half of last century, and it, it makes me feel really old to say last century, uh, was the aerospace era. We developed rockets, and we went to most of the objects in the solar system, and uh, uh, did some really cool things, the Apollo program. But I think this century is going to be the biology century. And, and I put the picture of this gentleman up, uh, uh, J. Craig Venter, uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, about a year and a half ago, he made a major breakthrough. He was able to take the DNA base pairs, and about a million of them, and stitch them together using, to be sure, a template that he already knew of a, back, of a living bacteria, uh, take another bacteria, destroy its genome, a different species entirely, put this one in and boot it up. And just to prove that it was his bacteria, uh, he changed the color of the dye, he put some poetry in it, and a copyright. Uh, <laughs> But we are beginning the era of, of true genetic engineering. I believe the critical technology to human expansion in space is not just aerospace, but also the ability to actually program biology. Uh, you can take all these wonderful machines to Mars, but they will fail. The, the supply chain is long. Uh, what you really need is a self-replicating programmable machine. Uh, we finally discovered we've had that for billions of years. It's called biology. So our ability to program that is the critical one. So if there's one message you take away today, uh, that's the one I'd like you to take away. Now, the search for life in our solar system obviously begins with Mars. Uh, the, uh, uh, of course, a century ago or more, everybody was convinced there was life on Mars. In fact, I understood in the late 19th century there was a prize for the first person to find life on another world. But it couldn't be Mars, because that was considered too easy. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and in fact, Orson Welles in the 30s had the Martians attack, and uh, based on H.G. Wells' book. Uh, and uh, everybody believed it. You know, people were jumping out of windows and you know, throwing money away and so on, just like today. Uh, 
Now, when we got to Mars, it didn't look very lifelike. Uh, now, I thought it looked lifelike. Uh, I went to graduate school in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, but people tell me, no, it didn't look very lifelike. But things have changed. We are finding that the surface of Mars shows evidence of substantial amounts of volatiles, uh, frozen water. Uh, we're seeing glaciers. We see it even snows on Mars. Uh, and the Phoenix lander showed that, that just under the surface in the polar regions, and this extends pretty far uh, towards the Martian equator, uh, is a lot of ice. In fact, if you melted all of the water on Mars, uh, which we believe has happened a few times in its history, uh, you would have an ocean several hundred meters deep. Uh, so this is becoming a, a changing view of the planet. And I also want to leave with you again on the, th the, the, the subject of life. There's two things you want to look for for looking for life. One is a, a liquid. The second is some evidence of non-equilibrium uh, products, probably gases. Uh, these are things that can't be maintained easily by natural processes, but need some sort of life process. Well, Mars looking even more interesting from the high-rise and other imagers. Uh, this is one of the coolest pictures, and I, I don't have the, the time lapse, but these little fingers at the bottom are actually flowing water uh, that is coming out of, this is at the edge of a glacier. Uh, so we are seeing that there are water processes, actually liquid water processes, going on uh, near the surface. If you look at this over a whole Martian year, you can see these things come and go and flow uh, and change. So we are seeing liquid water. Now again, I won't say anything about this because you're going to hear a lot about it, uh, but this is the first mission potentially able to find real evidence of life, uh, although there are those that believe the Viking landers found some life evidence, uh, in fact, incredible life evidence. Uh, although I do want to say there's a lot of discussion about the Mars uh, Science Laboratory is a life finder. In fact, it's actually a geology mission uh, that didn't really get designed for life. Uh, now it's capable of doing a lot, but the next missions need to be designed for looking, looking for life. Now, there's some tantalizing evidence, and obviously one of the things we're going to look for is, is, uh, is uh, confirmation of this. Uh, these are, this is Goddard spaceflight data, uh, and as I usually talk about it, I say that's probably wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, actually, my scientists think it's wrong. I think it's right, so I need to clarify that. But it shows evidence of one of these potentially non-equilibrium gases, methane, uh, varying with the Martian seasons. Uh, I actually believe this is, is evidence of some sort of microbial subsurface life, uh, and this is a very interesting question. Uh, I will say that in order to get to that life, we need to drill and uh, the next missions to Mars need to do drills. Uh, now, I actually, I have another way to do it is you run into things. Uh, and as a military guy, I love that. We did that with the moon a few years ago. It was pretty cool. But uh, uh, that's a good way to blast down and find the stuff, although there's always the risk that said, there was life on Mars, but you killed it. <laughs> uh, there are other places in the solar system that we now know have a lot of uh, water. Uh, Europa is a, uh, one of the large moons of uh, Jupiter. It is a planet-wide ocean because of the, uh, the Jovian gravity field uh, uh, and the, uh, the compression and, and so forth on the, the interior of Europa. It's heated. The bottom of the European Ocean, which we think is a few tens of kilometers deep, uh, maybe a lot like the bottom of our ocean where you have thermal vents uh, and you have processes providing energy. And if you have the right chemicals, this is a place that we could have life. Again, there's a problem of getting through the few kilometers of ice on the surface. Uh, again, I like the idea of running an asteroid into it and blowing a hole in it. But, uh, but uh, you know, that comes from my background. Uh, other places for life, Enceladus. Uh, it's one of the inner moons of Saturn. Uh, it's a icy moon, so it uh, is made of, of, uh, of uh, hydrocarbon volatiles and water ice. Uh, but we are seeing, because again of the, of the uh, gravitational uh, heating of the internal uh, parts of Enceladus, that there are, are water jets that are jetting from the surface of Enceladus. So this may be a place we can sample uh, directly the interior material and see if there's evidence of life. Now, 
water isn't the only fluid. Uh, the hydrocarbon lakes on Saturn, uh, the uh, ethane, methane, and so forth, are places that potentially you have uh, the conditions for some sort of weird life. Uh, and these are pretty extensive lakes. In fact, I, there's a mission that NASA is planning, a pretty bold one, that maybe put a boat in one of these, uh, these lakes uh, that can begin to move around and, and sample it. Uh, uh, you can tell it's one that we picked because most of the senior former military people at NASA are Navy uh, or Marines, so I, that, that's naturally why they would pick that. It was up to me, we would sample the, uh, the atmosphere. But uh, uh, there's actually a, a, a paper by uh, Chris McKay and H.G. Uh, and Smith, uh, uh, some of the Ames folks, uh, that suggests that if you look at the gases in the, in the ti uh, Titan's atmosphere, that there are non-equilibrium levels that could be explained by some sort of strange alien life uh, in those liquids. So uh, life is certainly possible elsewhere. Now, the question is, where else in the universe? Well, I won't talk about Kepler. There's a talk right after mine. Uh, but uh, Kepler is an Ames mission. Uh, it was done jointly with JPL. Uh, really cool mission. It's the first one that is finding Earth-size planets in terrestrial-type orbits around other stars. Uh, we've got thousands of planets found. It, it finds them by seeing as the planet goes in front of the star, we get a small decrease of light. So it's statistically, you'll find some planetary systems edge on. Uh, we now have a number of candidates that appear to be terrestrial size uh, in the habitable zone, which is where the equilibrium temperature is such that liquid water could be on the surface. Now, when I initially asked my scientist about what that meant, they had a chart, and they showed this little blue dot, and I said, what's that? And they said, well, it's outside the habitable zone, but it's the Earth. And so I, uh, I said, well, we're going to have to amend that slightly. Uh, but uh, because of the greenhouse effect, uh, it's, uh, we're actually finding uh, that life could exist more extensively. Now, the neat thing about all this, and this is a theme I want to leave with you, is that uh, one of the cool things about working in the space program is you get to make science fiction real. And uh, when I grew up in, you know, the 16th century, uh, the, uh, we were trained in astronomy that, uh, that you couldn't form a planet in a binary system because it would, the binary star gravity fields would be so strange they would disrupt it. Well, Kepler says not so. There's a lot of them. We've actually found multiple planet systems now. Uh, the first one of these, uh, the nice people at Lucas Films, uh, allowed us to call it Tatooine. And uh, so we, we did a little artist uh, uh, rendition of what it would look like if Luke was walking on the surface of the planet and saw that it was actually a red dwarf and a, and a yellow uh, dwarf, uh, much like the sun. Uh, although the equilibrium temperature on the surface of this is about 115 below zero, uh, so he would have to be better dressed. Uh, but uh, again, this is a really neat thing. Now, just recently, uh, and I, I can't resist showing this about science fiction, uh, a planet has been discovered that looks like it's breaking up, HIC one two five five seven five four eight. I think we might better call that Alderaan. And those of you that remember Star Wars, be honest, how many of you <laughs> are Star Wars geeks? Yeah, this audience is about to be. Uh, but uh, you remember the destruction of the planet by these two nice gentlemen, uh, <laughs> former colleagues of mine, I might add. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Governor Tarkin looks like the former commander of Air Force Space Command, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but what are we going to look for if we're going to try to find uh, life on these planets? Kepler can't find any data, or doesn't, isn't capable of getting data to find uh, uh, life. However, uh, if you look at the three terrestrial planets, uh, Mars, Earth, and Venus, that have atmospheres, there's some significant differences. Uh, the, the, the first difference is the presence of a lot of, uh, of a non-equilibrium gas, in the case of Earth, oxygen. Uh, oxygen won't survive for long periods of time unless it's maintained by, by a, a life process. Uh, you find not much carbon dioxide, but on these other planets you find a lot. So even though I said that Mars may have life, I don't think it has a lot, uh, or else we would see changes in its atmosphere. So what we're going to look for on planets around other stars is evidence of a fluid 
probably water, uh, and a non-equilibrium gas, probably oxygen. Uh, the first instrument capable of doing this will be the James Webb Space Telescope. In very special cases, if there is a planet uh, in the habitable zone around a relatively cool star nearby that's eclipsing, so in other words, it's like Kepler is able to see, we just might be able to get the atmospheric spectrum. So sometime near the end of this decade, uh, we may find a true life-bearing exoplanet. But more likely, it'll take new instruments. Uh, at JPL, Ames, and other places, we're wor working on what's called a coronagraph. You have to block the light out of the primary star, which is at least a billion times higher than the light from the planet, and then get a spectrum of it. Uh, this is one approach. It's called an internal a coronagraph. Another one that I find really cool is what's called New World's Imager, which is where instead of blocking the light out inside your telescope, you put, you know, a light shade thousands of kilometers out in the distance, uh, and you block the light out, and then you image the star. Uh, now, I put an airship on here because it, uh, we're actually doing tests now. We have an airship, a commercial airship, at Ames. Uh, that uh, is able to suspend one of these light shades, and so we can actually do experiments today to see if this method will work. So again, pretty cool stuff. You know, stay tuned. I think you know we can talk about things that NASA ought to do in addition to looking for life in our solar system. We need to do these uh, missions as well. Now, let me turn to the final topic here: is uh, uh, the expansion of human life, and I also put human-derived life, and you, you'll see what I mean in a second. Uh, obviously, our vision is large-scale Mars settlement. That's why you're all here, I think. Uh, and it's, uh, by the way, uh, I'll address the statement about you can't live on the Martian surface, but I think you can, uh, and, or certainly near the surface. Now, the question is, though, what if we get to Mars and find there's life there already? Now, I put this picture up because this was from the 1990s when uh, a, a piece of Mars that, uh, that we find occasionally, uh, a meteorite, that we know it's Martian because it has Martian gases in the atmosphere, uh, that or in the rock that match the Martian atmosphere. There was a discovery of a sort of what looked like maybe fossilized bacteria inside. Uh, now this is now believed to not be evidence of life, although there's an interesting story behind it that I can't resist telling. Is NASA when they found this went over to the White House and told the White House. White House thought this was a great thing for President Clinton to do. And uh, so they had discussions at the White House. But one of the White House staffers, and I won't mention his name, but you can look it up, uh, it seems that he had a uh, for pay girlfriend, I don't know how you would say that more delicately, uh, <laughs> that he met at the Mayflower Hotel, which is a place politicians need to stay away from. Uh, they, they do give government discounts, by the way. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, uh, and, and he told her, and she told the press, and so it all got kind of goofed up in the rollout. So if we do find life, be careful who you tell at the White House. Uh, this is a secret picture that I got a hold of, and uh, we did change the words on it a little bit. <laughs> uh, but uh, the reason I talk about this is because if there is extant life on Mars, there will be a bipartisan concern about it. Uh, because if you're a liberal, you're worried about us killing it. And if you're a conservative, you're worrying about it, kill, it killing us. So, so it may be that, that, that we will be prohibited uh, until we can figure out the character of this life uh, from settling on Mars. There are other locations. Uh, this one is, uh, I, I hesitate to show a picture of these other objects at a Mars Society meeting, but uh, we now believe that there are substantial amounts of volatiles that we could use to support our life on the lunar pole. Uh, this was data from the uh, Elcross lunar impactor that we did a few years ago in an Ames mission. Uh, but these are all the basic ingredients for life. Uh, there are also asteroids. Uh, many of these asteroids have substantial quantities of volatiles necessary to support life. Uh, this is Ceres, which we just completed our visits to Ceres. It is, uh, or Esta, Vesta, pardon me, we're going to Ceres. Sorry. It says Vesta on it, yeah. You see what happens when you get old? The, uh, but uh, Vesta has substantial quantities of volatiles, uh, another location potentially we could think about human settlement. There's even some interesting ideas about dragging asteroids back into Earth orbit and, and putting bubbles around them. So uh, I just uh, note those. Now, 
I'd like to kind of talk a little bit about other technology. And uh, uh, the, uh, uh, and the reason I, when I say settle the solar system, it may be not us exactly that do it. Uh, or we might do it, you know, hand in claw with a robot. Uh, this could be good or it could be not so good, as we've seen in movies. Uh, but I think it's beginning to be real. Uh, I'm convinced the next step in artificial intelligence is quantum computing. Uh, we have begun an initiative at Ames uh, involving, uh, this is a first generation, you know, quantum computer of sorts. Uh, but we think that there's a lot of neat things that can do, and I won't get into that. The other one is biology. Now, advanced biotech is, is an interesting technology. Uh, how many of you know what species 8472 is? Okay, good. Uh, it was an advanced species that uh, Star Trek uh, Voyager discovered that, uh, that had a very complicated genome, and they were able to do things like grow their spaceship uh, and, uh, and other cool things. Uh, this is science fiction, but, but uh, we're convinced now that we could actually do things like grow pieces of spaceships. Uh, so NASA has started a synthetic biology initiative. Uh, we are teamed with people like the J. Craig Venter Institute. Uh, I think this is the key technology needed to actually expand uh, into the solar system. Uh, I show this. This is cyanobacteria, uh, which is maybe one of the oldest forms of life on Earth. It may even have arisen on Mars and been the first species to come to Earth. We may all be Martians. Uh, but it has the unique property of, uh, in the presence of the right fluid, water, uh, minerals, uh, and solar energy, uh, it can synthesize uh, just about every chemical you need. Uh, today it's used for food, uh, spirulina, uh, but the food tastes really hideous. Uh, I've tried it. It's sold in kind of, you know, liberal markets in Northern California. Uh, <laughs> But we think we can modify this stuff to actually taste like steak or something else that normal people would eat. Uh, so one of the ideas is that you're, you have a settlement, another world. You're able to print out the genome. Uh, you can either you, you know, develop your own code or it can be transmitted to you from Earth. So whether it's the moon or Mars or wherever, an interesting technology. Now, I, I want to show this team, uh, there's a competition called the International Genetic Engineered Machines Competition for, uh, for undergraduates. Uh, we helped uh, the Stanford Brown team. You might have heard of Stanford. It's a small teacher's college near Ames. Uh, the, uh, uh, not much of a football team, I guess. But uh, yeah, Berkeley beat them. Uh, but uh, uh, these young people uh, uh, demonstrated last year what's called a, uh, where they, they built a biological brick, one of the first things you want to do to stay out of the radiation on places like Mars or the Moon is have shelter. So they were able to modify a, a bacteria to produce an epoxy that was able to, with very small amounts of water, to make lunar concrete. And we're now looking at Mars concrete. This year's iGEM team is, from Brown and Stanford, is looking at taking, there, there are bacteria that, that individually have features that could survive on the Martian surface. There's uh, something called radioduron's, uh, which is able to survive in uh, uh, high radiation environments. There are others that can survive in very cold environments, uh, desiccated environments, high acid environments. If we take all those features and are able to program them into a single bacteria, it might be possible to, uh, to provide a bacteria that's uh, on the surface of Mars. Now, what's the role of NASA in all this? Well, we can do these biology experiments on this neato biology lab that, that we built, and we're doing a lot of that. Uh, as was mentioned, variable gravity studies are needed. Uh, one possibility for the future is to build a deep space uh, rotating structure somewhere in cislunar space. Uh, we're looking at this. We're also developing the critical technology, and I won't go over these things, but there are things like uh, various in situ resource utilization, concepts such as synthetic biology, uh, the uh, fuel depots, electric propulsion, and so forth. Uh, I think that what NASA can, can do, and uh, indeed may well do, is sometime around 2030, maybe sooner, uh, go to this object. Uh, this is uh, Phobos. Uh, it is the ideal location, I think, to really conduct the extensive exploration to see if Mars has life 
before we would send humans there. Uh, so lots of interesting possibilities. But I really believe that uh, the folks that are going to settle Mars are probably not the government. Uh, it's probably the private sector. Uh, commercial space transportation is real. Uh, you're going to hear about that during this conference. Of course, SpaceX did a spectacular feat. Anybody that doubts that America has the right stuff, uh, we got it in spades. Uh, you know, nobody else could, could build uh, these kind of things on, on short notice. But there's a lot of commercial interest, not just in getting to orbit, but doing things uh, on the moon, uh, on asteroids, and I think eventually Mars. Uh, we're seeing commercial companies going to the moon, first of all, to win a prize. Uh, there's, a, there's a small startup next to me, uh, Giggle or Google or something, uh, that offered a prize. Uh, which they can certainly afford. They have $40 billion of cash. Uh, but uh, we're seeing people commercially work on this. Uh, others, you know, also financed by some of those same folks that are going to look for minerals on asteroids. Uh, but probably the most interesting one is Mars. Now, a few years ago, some of you may remember this. Uh, this was Google's uh, sign-in site. It suggested there was a new joint venture between Google and the Virgin Corporation to recruit settlers to go to Mars. Now, this appeared on April 1st, so everybody said, oh, it's a joke. <laughs> now, I know those guys. They're not kidding. Uh, I think this is going to be real at some time in the future, uh, and it's going to be financed by, by people like those executives. Uh, this is one that I think is really cool. For the last year, we've been working with SpaceX. Uh, the Falcon Heavy, which is going to be launched in about a year, uh, can throw the Dragon capsule to Mars. And it just so happens that Elon, now I'm sure it isn't by accident, you can ask him, designed that capsule so it can land on the surface of Mars using the escape rockets that it was going to use uh, on Earth, which obviously if you get to Mars, you didn't have to use them. Uh, so we are looking at uh, potentially using this to do science, initially to drill into the Martian regolith down into the ice layers to see where we get below the layers that radiation may have destroyed any, uh, any biological molecules. Uh, and this we think we can do fairly cheaply. So there's a lot of excitement what the private sector can do there. Now, I want to state that, you know, settlements have a long history in, in North America of being one way, uh, that privately funded one way settlements, I think, are, uh, are in our blood and our uh, genetic material. Uh, and I believe this is one of the things that will happen, uh, maybe even in the, in the 2020s. Uh, I suspect that they'll live initially in caves. Uh, that's another way to get out of the radiation. Uh, you need about a meter of, of rock between you and the radiation. Uh, we now know there are a lot of caves on Mars, uh, so the first Martians may end up being cavemen and women again. Uh, but uh, you can seal the cave and, and I think use synthetic biology to uh, uh, to survive for long periods. Now, I just put this picture up because uh, uh, this is also science fiction, but uh, maybe not. Uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, I and the DARP, some senior guy at DARPA got in trouble for starting something called the 100-Year Starship Project, uh, which now has neither NASA nor DOD involved in it, but it is going forward. Uh, things like Kepler we ought to be able to find planets uh, like Pandora. Uh, which are moons orbiting large planets in a habitable zone. In fact, we're beginning to look for if these exist. Uh, so I think the future is unlimited. Uh, I suspect Mars will be the first step, uh, and you folks are the pioneers. Let me stop there, and thank you. Okay, I have time for a few questions here. Let's see, in the back. Nobody calls in the back first. So. What sort, of com what sort of computing race do you think quantum computers will eventually be capable of? Well, what sort of computers? It computing rates, like flops. Uh, the key thing with a quantum machine isn't the rate. In fact, you only have a small number of qubits. The key issue with, uh, that, with the, a quantum machine is that it can solve a class of problems, or some of the class of problems, called NP-hard. Uh, if you want to look at, 